The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? For your, fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him who I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and appointed him, anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Then the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servants said to him, Behold now, a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, Provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. One of the young men answered, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me David, your son, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey laden with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them by David, his son, to Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his service. And Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it in it played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. We've probably all heard it said, the Lord works in mysterious ways. And probably that's a bit of a throw your arms up kind of statement. Like just when something happens and we couldn't have seen it or imagined and we don't know what to do, we kind of make those statements. But biblically speaking, this is always true. Not just when we are surprised by an action or an activity, but simply stated, the Bible would say God's ways are higher than our ways. His thinking is above our thinking. And He works in ways that reverse our values or our assumptions about power and goodness and even the plan that we would have, he does things differently. Always, though, for our good and for his glory. We're going to see that clearly in 1 Samuel 16. But before we look at the text, would you pray with me? 
Father, we just sang a song written in recent years, a modern hymn that is asking you to speak, O Lord, to your church, to form us, to shape us by your word. What a fitting song for God's people to sing on a Sunday morning as we turn again to your word, a word you breathe out that teaches us, rebukes us, corrects us, and trains us. Father, we ask for that this morning. We each come with different situations in our lives, different personalities, different ways of rebelling against your mysteriousness. And so we ask that by your Spirit, you would administer your word to each of us in our situations. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the text begins with Samuel mourning. In fact, we don't actually hear Samuel say any of that. The Lord notes it and says, how long will you grieve over Saul? And that might seem a little rough. God, what do you, why, why would you even speak that way? Like, Who would say that to somebody who just saw the judgment of the Lord against the king of God's people and the utter failure of Saul to simply do the instructions God gave him to do? And Samuel wasn't just watching from afar. He was the one delivering these messages, announcing this judgment. He was personally involved. But God rebukes him. That language, how long will you grieve, is a loving rebuke. And here's why. He says, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel... God presses into Samuel and asks why he is grieving because the grieving seems to imply Samuel wants a different path. Samuel's not accepting what the Lord has done. This teaches us, this statement by God in verse 1, the very first line of our text, teaches us that God expected Samuel to be trusting in his plan and not human plans. He wanted Samuel, even when The road turned hard right or hard left when things didn't work out as he would have liked. But clearly God was at work. A judgment of God is a clear work of God for Samuel just to go with that, trust that. None of us does this well. All of us would have heard the same comment from God. Why are you not trusting in my plans? Why are you not accepting what I've done as if what I would do would be worse for you? Then had I let Saul be your king? I mean, think of the contrast. If God had put all his body weight in King Saul and not King Jesus. Now Samuel's not thinking that, but we can, from the perspective of the new covenant, look back and see how God would always raise up a king for himself. Remember we even called this series, 1 and 2 Samuel, it's God's king. It's always to be God's king. So as a way of teaching Samuel, and through his word, you and me, the church, God now teaches us in this text to trust his plans. And if it wasn't clear enough with the situation of the rejection of Saul, now in these powerful verses, God's going to show us, and even through Samuel, say how he is looking for things on the surface, and God has a totally different plan. This teaches us how to look for the ways God works in our lives, to trust his providence. Man, the older I get, the more God's providence becomes a big deal. The more I see the road go right or left, or things not happen as they do, the more the doctrine of God's providence, right, that the God who created all things also directs and sustains all things according to his perfect will. The the, the older I get, the longer I'm in the faith, the more I study his word, the more I grab providence like an anchor. Because I know that even in what I'm not judging or seeing, or what I fail to trust in, God is still God. And I want to align my life with his will and his purposes and trust in him. And mercifully, this text teaches us to do just that. 
So this text teaches us two things about the ways God works. And here's the first in the first 12 verses. I would summarize the the message like this. God's perfect plans do not always match our logic and reasoning. And even now, any any long-lived believer would smile at such a statement because you might even know evidence from your own life. Like you would you could just look back and say I would have never imagined at 22 or 32 or 42 where God would have worked in my life or where he would have led me. Like we could just do personal testimonies of such things. But watch how scripture affirms our own spiritual experiences. God counters Samuel's grieving in verse 1 by declaring there at the end of this lengthy first verse, he declares that he has provided for himself a king. That is really important. God would always be the one to provide the king. I have provided for myself a king. God would always provide the king for his people, and we know this will one day be King Jesus. It's not wrong to let the whole story explain the part. In fact, sometimes it it gives us a glance of exactly what God was doing, like looking at a picture of your children or yourselves when you're quite young, and knowing or looking at your spouse when they were a little boy or a little girl and seeing that's my future spouse or if you have adult children looking at them, thinking of them when they were four or five and seeing the same traits in them back then that they now display as a mom or a dad or a husband or a wife or whatever way they work and live like you could have you could see those traits We can see that in this. The king that God is choosing, the kingly royal line he is selecting, the way that he picks the future king reflect like an old picture of a little boy now well grown. It reflects what God was always intending to do. But until King Jesus comes, in this text, we begin to see a template. He's, he's, He's establishing a template for his future an ultimate king. Not a king that we would recognize or select. And none of us would have said, we wouldn't have even thought of the family of Jesse. Who's Jesse? We, nobody would have gone to Bethlehem. The prophets praisingly laugh that God chose Bethlehem and not Jerusalem. Like none of that would have what we would have chosen. You would have expected an Ivy League or a major city, or a family of great reputation, not just somebody who doesn't even bring in the future king from out in the the fields because he's tending to the sheep because he's so low in rank in the family. Nobody would have picked him as king because nobody thinks like God thinks. In fact, the text shows us in four different ways how Samuel's mindset was not aligned with God's mindset in regard to the future king. It wants us to see how Samuel's image of Israel's king and God's image of Israel's king is totally different, yet it forecasts for us so beautifully the identity and nature of the ultimate king, Jesus. I want to show you that. The first is in verses 2 and 3. Samuel fears going to anoint a new king will endanger him if Saul finds out. No, duh. God says, hey, I know there's a king already. I want you to go to some family. It's going to be public news and tell one of their sons that they're going to be king. You'll be good. Seriously? Samuel's like, well, how do I do this? How can I go? Again, maybe Samuel already hearing the rebuke in verse one is kind of thinking, am I supposed to challenge God? But that just sounds suicidal. If Saul hears, Samuel says, he will kill me. So the Lord says, well, put it in the context of sacrifice. Go and offer a sacrifice. Invite that family. I'll show you the king. Notice how the king is connected to sacrifice. The context of sacrifice foreshadows the fact that the ultimate king will serve in the context of sacrifice. 
of the whole beautiful portrait of Christ on the throne in Revelation is him imaged as a lamb. And the very first time the descendants of Jesus Christ are selected, the very first statement made in the beginning of 1 Samuel 16, verses 2 and 3, is the context of sacrifice. God, from the beginning of the Old Testament story, wanted you to think of a royal king and a suffering servant. Here's the second thing. In verses 4 and 5, Samuel was at least apparently surprised to be sent to Bethlehem for people to consecrate themselves for the sacrifice. Like Bethlehem? In this way, God establishes Bethlehem as the source of King David and the eternal King Jesus. As the prophet Micah would say in chapter 5, verse 2, But you, O Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Like who would have picked Bethlehem? So notice, the, notice what's immediately t- the template of this future king. Two things are revealed. Sacrifice and this no-name little town that has no political or spiritual relevance until now in the history of God's people. Here's a third thing in verses 6 and 7, and maybe these are the verses we know the most if we're familiar at all with the Old Testament stories in the book of 1 Samuel. Samuel looked for a king with certain physical and intellectual traits. I I love the language in verse 6. When they came, right, all these sons lined up, certainly in ancient culture that was far from egalitarian, meaning rights of all the brothers and sisters equally, it would be the oldest son. That would have been the assumption. And there he is, the the most grown. Unlike the little shepherd boy, he's got a beard maybe already. He's strong and mighty. He's been given all the benefits and the resources of the family because that's the way it worked. Sorry, middle children, younger children. It's a different day. So when they came, verse 6, he looked at Eliab, His name means, my God is Father, interestingly. And he thought, look at the text tells us what he's thinking. Notice how Scripture wants you to see things. It's just letting us know, Samuel didn't even say this, but the Lord hears the thoughts, surely the Lord's anointed is is before him. That's Bible language, like this has got to be the guy. This dude's impressive. But the Lord said to Samuel's thought patterns, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. And that that would have left us confused. Like, really? So not his power or his might, not the nature of being the firstborn. And the Lord explains For the Lord sees not as man sees. Brothers and sisters, underline that verse. Because man, that's hard for us. Because we want to get God into our lives when the rest of Scripture is trying to get us into God's life. And that is so hard to do. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. What does that mean, to look on the heart? That means God looks to the core of a person. He looks beyond the surfacey things. Well, what does this mean for us? Well, it means a couple things. One is the Lord does not depend on human strength, human intellect, or, or pedigree. He doesn't. He doesn't need any of that. And those are all the things we rely on, right? All the connections and the networking and all our skills and talents. Like we, that's all we have. God doesn't need any of those things. He doesn't need the oldest son of Jesse. In contrast, that what verse 7 teaches us about the heart or the core of a person, the Lord does seek obedience, humility, and compassion. So if you're wanting to be used by God, 
It will not be because of the strength of your mind or the strength of your hands or the strength of your connections. It will not be because you have wealth or pedigree or power and influence. It will simply be because you are compassionate, you are humble, and entirely unlike Saul, you are obedient. If you want an example of that, think Jesus. Finally, the fourth comparison, right? We, one was the context of sacrifice. The second was this little town of Bethlehem. Sounds like a good song maybe someone should write. Third would be it's, it's, it's not physical or intellectual traits. And fourth, verses 8 to 12, Samuel looked right in front of him, and yet the one God had chosen was not found. Like, it wasn't what Samuel could even see. That's so good for us to learn. The chosen king was in the field, keeping the sheep. Man, the comparisons to Jesus in the New Testament are so ridiculously beautiful. Are you following me for a second here? When God is announcing his coming king through this story in 1 Samuel 16, he just presents you this template of the future king that is so beautiful that it's like a whole canon of scripture is singing like a choir. The future king will be a shepherd who does not adopt the values of the world or fit the world's definition of success, who comes from the royal town of Bethlehem and who will, who will ultimately be consecrating himself to be a sacrifice for God. Remember that statement I've stolen from Augustine? The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed? The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed? Do you see the beautiful one complete story of the Bible envisioned through these words? So how does this text teach the church today to think about its ministry and its influence? Let's just not just put this on poor old Samuel. Let's know for sure that when we just saying, speak, O Lord, to form us, that God fully intended this word and even this example of Samuel, not just to have us say, yes, Samuel, get with it, but for us to see a mirror into our own lives. This text rebukes our natural tendency to trust too much in human strength, intellect, and pedigree. Like the same way we would be trusting like Samuel does, this text rebukes us. This is not to deny God's common grace, like wanting a pastor who's never been to seminary, just like you probably wouldn't an electrician who's never been a journeyman. You probably wouldn't want a surgeon who's never been to med school or a mechanic like me. You wouldn't want any of those things. Like you would want somebody with skills, fair enough, but it's simply saying we're not trusting in those things. This rebuke is warning us not to equate the world's ways with God's ways. Brothers and sisters, that is so hard to do. We are so tempted to think of power and influence in the way the world works. We see this in Christians all the time. We think it's got to be a certain governor. It's got to be a certain president. It's got to be a certain amount of money. It's got to be marketing and branding. We got to bring in Tim Tebow. Otherwise, nobody else can preach the gospel. We got to do that. We got to take the world's method of power and influence, and we just got to baptize them and do them in our church. And the Lord laughs at such things. Like, did you not read the story God would say? I went to Bethlehem, not New York, not LA, not Washington, D.C., Bethlehem. It was like a grain, it was like a farming community. Bethlehem literally means house of food. They're farmers. And we can see this, for example, in the church today, how the idol of celebrity in our culture has been adopted entirely by the American church. And then we can hear the Apostle Paul speaking or singing the same tune when he says these words in 1 Corinthians. For consider your calling, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. 
Not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. He hasn't stopped doing that. In fact, he did that long before Paul said these words in 1 Samuel 16. Another application we can gain from this is that Christians and churches almost certainly need to rethink their definition of success. What does a successful Christian look like? Does it match the American dream, health and wealth and the pursuit of happiness? Does it mean you will know everything, be overflowing with wisdom, have no problems, have perfectly obedient children who get straight A's, and read the Bible more than they watch TV? If it doesn't assume suffering and sacrifice, it's probably more American than Christian. What does a successful church look like? It's probably usually rated by the three B's. Building, budget, and bodies. Is that how God would look at a successful church? If a successful church doesn't define success based on suffering and sacrifice, suffering and sacrifice for God, for one another, and for our community, it's probably more American than Christian. We have much to learn with Samuel from this text. The text ends in verses 13 to 23, and it's a bit of a weird statement there, especially in verse 14. I summarize this last half of the text by simply saying this, God works not by might nor by power, but by His Spirit. And the reason I say that is because look what happens the moment David is selected. The moment God's king is chosen, he is empowered by the Spirit of God. Verse 13, then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. This is the work of the Spirit as it was defined in the Old Covenant, which would come upon people for a specific occasion or specific task. I've talked on this before, but summarizingly, in the Old Covenant, God's Spirit was active and alive, but it was not mediated through Christ yet, so God would put His finger on people and give them the Spirit to do certain tasks. Kings, builders, certain priests or prophets who would have the Word of the Lord. Not every, not every believer, but key believers. Because Christ hadn't fulfilled all those offices yet, And the Spirit hadn't been mediated by His life and His death. In the New Covenant, the Spirit indwells in a richer and fuller way. All of you who are believers in Jesus Christ have the indwelling Holy Spirit, guiding you into all truth, rebuking you, ministering, even as I prayed a few minutes ago, that God's Word would minister to you by His Spirit. The permanence of the Spirit on David is likely because from his line would come the true king. But this also means that the Spirit leaves Saul. His task is done. Remember Old Covenant, right? The Spirit comes for a time, but then leaves. It leaves Saul, but worse, that God judges Saul by the Spirit. Verse 14 is plain and simple confusing. Look what it says. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. That's discomforting to say the least. It is not best interpreted as a demonic force to attack Satan. It is not best interpreted as some kind of cruelty of our loving God. The verse is using the language of judgment, like an angel of judgment in 2 Kings 19. In fact, the Hebrew phrase means something, it's not quite a harmful spirit, but this, it could easily and probably more accurately be translated, the spirit who brings forth 
disaster. The spirit who brings forth judgment. This is a, this is a judgment of God. This is a consequence of soul's rebellion of God. It, it echoes what we see in the New Testament. James 3.1 says, those who lead will be twice judged. Think of Judas's gruesome death after betraying Christ. It was an act of judgment. Interestingly, befitting the fatherhood of God, the text reveals that in God's perfect providence, Saul would eventually not only bring David, his future replacement, into his service, but that the Spirit of God in David would be a healing agent or blessing for Saul. So even when God judges, he is gracious. So what do these verses teach us specifically about the Spirit? And that needs to be stated in our day today. First of all, Christians need to understand the primary role the Holy Spirit plays in their lives and ministry. Our tradition, brothers and sisters, either overemphasizes the Spirit or underemphasizes the Spirit. We have a hard time being balanced. And probably this church in particular, I've, I've jokingly said before, barring from others, our temptation would be we believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Scripture. We don't know what to do with Spirit. We like the Father and the Son. Spirit, we don't want to be like other people that go crazy with all those things. But which error is worse? An imbalanced spirit on one side or an imbalanced spirit on the other? The Spirit is the ultimate worker of God in among His people. Our salvation is a work of the Spirit. God's provision is a work of the Spirit. And proof of that is not just in the New Testament, but even in this text when it clearly shows the coming of the Spirit on the future King. We are tempted to trust in our skills, and God's Word would say, not by might, nor by power, but by His Spirit. Even more, we can say that Christians can trust that what God is doing in their lives or in this church is spirit-led and spirit-empowered, even if, get this, even if they can't see it. David was still the young sheep keeper, not even in the eyesight or reach of Samuel, Yet that is exactly who God had chosen. And God didn't say, oh, oh, don't go to the house. Go out to the field. No, he let them stand in the house and watch seven impressive men go by. And when God rejected all of them one by, he, did, he could have just said, hey, all of these are wrong. He didn't. What about this one? Nope. What about that one? Nope. What about that one? Nope. Nothing Samuel saw was actually the reality. So much so that Samuel says, Lord, or Jesse, that is, do you have any more kids? You got to have more kids, right? Well, technically, yes, but he's the runt. He's out in the field, like the oldest son, Eliab, that, he's right there. Notice how the text teaches us not just to trust even what we see, but that God is clearly willing to work in ways that we cannot yet perceive because we live not by might nor by sight not by power not by persuasion not by our influence but by God's spirit and too many of us are tempted to expect God to work like a microwave when he really likes to work like a crock pot. And that is so hard for us in a culture, I've said this before, that loves control. We love control. We're all type A one way or another. We like control and we want the microwave and we want to see one minute. And God puts it in a crock pot and says, not by might, nor by power but by my spirit. So what is God, the same God who worked for his people 
way back when in the Old Covenant in 1 Samuel 16, what is that same God doing in your life right now? When you're trying to push a microwave God, and you just got a crockpot God, or hey, we could do smoked meat, guys, we got it. You got a smoked meat God, you do not have a microwave God. And he's cooking something great. The aroma itself is beautiful, yet you're wanting to open a microwave. So are you willing to wait? Are you willing to trust? Are you willing to believe, as we talked about at the beginning, that God's ways are mysterious and he's doing things now you can't even see? But when you look back, you'll look and say, oh, just like in the New Testament times, God's people looked back at this story and said, isn't that interesting? That the calling of the royal line of David was the themes of shepherding. We, we, we have the themes of sacrifice. We have the theme of Bethlehem. And we have the theme of character and perfection that perfectly line up with Jesus, and yet we never even knew his name. But when we saw him, the whole story fit together beautifully. I'm going to pray for us in a minute, but I, I want to remind you, even as we are getting ready to close our service and sing a song you may know, Come Thou Fount. I want you to notice that in that song, we, the words in that song we will sing want us to look back at the past ways God has worked in our lives. And we actually will sing, Father, help us to trust you. Bind me, we sing. Help me to trust you. Even when I don't see what you're doing, help me to trust you. And the crock pot you are making in this world and in this community, and in this church, and in my family, and in my life. Help me to trust you. But before we sing that, let me pray for us. Father, you are such a good God. And your word mercifully pastors us to see what is right, and what is true, and what is good. Father, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us. But to your people, it is the power of God. So even as we sing this song as the children of God, the same God in whom Samuel was called to trust, the same God who selected a royal line from Bethlehem that would later bring forth your son, Jesus Christ, help us to know we can trust in you now in the crock pot of this situation in which we live we can trust that you are a master chef. Your plan is perfect. And it might even be things we can't yet see. So receive this song, Father, as a, a prayer and an offering to you in Jesus' name. Amen.